Hi, I'm Porpentine. I'm probably best known for making a bunch of games like Howling Dogs and Crystal Warrior Kesha, plus organizing and curating around the accessible game design software known as Twine. I'm now going to say a series of words that will end in about 20 minutes. I get asked questions like, what was your inspiration? When did you decide to do this? I don't believe in the intentional versus unintentional dichotomy. I feel like it diminishes the writing of feminine people. I believe that my subconscious is a skill and no less important than anything I can identify as a conscious decision. Gender in my games. <laughs> Nearly every character in my games is feminine, she or they. A lot of media spreads the belief that femmes can't survive on their own, can't have friendships and romances and alliances of their own. But I'm not really interested in anything else. I approach hypertext like cinema or music a lot of the time. Oh wait, I skipped ahead of slide, sorry. I like to imagine trans practices as unique as each universe. Anemone genital implants, magical anti-androgen glyphs, a vampire schoolgirl sucking on estrogenated blood. I approach hypertext like cinema or music. To me, Hypertext is more like a camera or a lyric than a page of text. I like the intimacy that comes with individual sentences and words. People don't want to read, they want to die. I love random generation. I'm interested in creating narrative impressions from randomized parts, kind of like a poem that changes each time. Each game of Love is Zero is, it generates like, you have these normal branching choices, but it generates this lyric in parallel with your choices. So it's kind of like this engine for processing the normal choices that happened in a choose your own adventure game. I also made a game called Her Car is the Edge of the World. It's about being a woman who drives around in her car and murders people. You do this by looking at people on the road and deciding whether to give them a ride or not. The game presents you with a randomly selected set of characteristics. <sighs> like their hair or clothes or whatever. These characteristics aren't tied to any mechanics or bonuses. There isn't much of an in-game persona to share responsibility with. This places responsibility directly on the player. I'm interested in presenting unusual choices to the player that interrogate them as a person without the interruption of fictional incentives. In her car is the edge of the world, the protagonist is never caught. Like the monstrous femmes from my other games, she never dies. Most media that explores monstrous femininity usually kills them at the end. People want to be entertained, but they don't want to consider what the day-to-day -day life of a monster is like. They might have to feel guilt. Now I'm going to talk about walls and space in my games. Armada is an action RPG where you play a slime girl who, play, who sprays slime. You go through the game hemmed in by walls and other barriers, like in many graphical games. One of the endings, however, turns you into an agent of corruption. Now you spray glitch slime, which eats away at whatever it touches, like acid, changing colors, destroying barriers. Instead of representing the chaos ending through dialogue or cutscenes, I made it so every time you use the most common command of a game, it makes everything go to shit. <laughs> Pink Zone, on the other hand, has no walls. Not the normal kind, anyways. Things will slow you down, but never stop you from moving completely. There is only friction. And you kind of figure out what things are in this Rorschachian kind of way uh, by interacting with them. I like to use space in my twine games, too. In Cyber Queen, which is about being haunted by an evil AI, it starts out with a more traditional spatial map where you can walk around a spaceship and pick up weapons, that kind of thing. Over time, it dissolves into abstract space. You're no longer clicking on places, you're clicking on emotions. Every time the game makes you think you have control again, like when you escape from Cyber Queen, it does this by reasserting the map. When you're caught, it dissolves again. The effect is of being toyed with by a superior intelligence. Twine is really good at summoning up these changing states because of how amorphous the hyperlink is. 
physicality in my games. Everything you swallow will one day come up like a stone is a game about suicide. People are afraid to let a living woman talk about suicide. At the moment of death, the mental distress, untrustworthy, stigmatized, is translated to physical evidence, trustworthy, vindicated, manipulable. If you're dead, you get a million reblogs, but a living woman talking about her experiences gets 165. It seems counterintuitive to wait until people are dead before listening to them, but I think I understand. They don't want to think about the sheer number of trans people who need housing and food and healthcare, because if you think about that, then you have to think about the system that creates those artificial scarcities in the first place and how fucked everything is. It's way easier to solve a corpse's problems than the messy problems of someone who is still alive. It's way easier to co-opt co a corpse for your agenda than listen to the uncomfortable truths of someone who is still alive. I hosted the game for 24 hours, then deleted it. Many important subjects are reduced to frictionless, rebloggable fodder for neoliberal emotional consumerism, so I wanted to make a game that required outside intervention for its survival, just like suicide. With Those We Love Alive is a game where you draw symbols on yourself to react to parts of the story. I was really uh, surprised by how many people did this. I got like hundreds of drawings. And um, it's kind of a big deal to me with my job to uh, get this kind of circulation of energy back to me after I make something. Um, so it was a really different experience from when I normally fling something out to the shadow audience void. Um, and it was just very touching for me. I call some of my games therapeutic because they're in dialogue with the body. And with those who love alive, you meditate, draw on yourself, and talk about trauma. There is kind of this active, curious voice in a lot of my games, curious about the person on the other end. A lot of the upgrades people have made to the internet are really boring. I'm interested in the mysteries, the in-between places, the people still love at 3 a.m. I like to think about who might find something I made and how intimate that connection is. So I write intimately. Here are some random games I'm working on right now. This is about a post-apocalyptic salon society. <laughs> Trying so hard to click it with my non-dominant hand. media for you. And as a trans woman, I really love Cars and Blood, so I wanted to kind of make a game about an exultant, you know, femme racer. Uh, I don't really have anything besides the intro. Maybe it'll just be that, I don't know. This is inspired by the Catamites marker games, where you draw graphics on an index card with marker and scan them in and make a game. It's really kind of easy to do and nice and compact and cozy. Websites to sell art with. A lot of what I make wouldn't work with gatekeeping or big campaigns, so I use sites that allow me to focus on quick turnaround and smaller creations. Teespring will print and ship shirts with your design on them as long as enough people pledge to your campaign. Shirts can be a little expensive unless you reduce your take. This was offset by not having to make or ship the shirts. If your main objective is getting people to wear your designs, it's a good option. The uh, the female-oriented shirts run a bit tight, so I suggest selling a variety of uh, types since there's no such thing as a female or male body. Gumroad is good for selling smaller things. One thing I've learned selling my degenerate filth is that a lot of online uh, marketplaces don't like it when you sell explicit, explicit sexual content, so I had to remove uh, certain images from this. They can be more lenient if stuff looks like it fits under some weird cultural standard of art, or if it's more text-based. So just a heads up. Gumroad takes a cut of 5%. Oh wait, oh no, oh no, wrong thing. It's so horrible. <laughs> it 
One thing I'd like to do is disable the option to ask people for a name when they buy something. Things that ask people for names can be daunting in a world where we often have to use or conceal dead ones. Patreon is my main source of income. It's kind of a way to subscribe to a person instead of a product. The figure you see isn't exactly what people receive though, because Patreon takes about a 9% cut, and some people's cards bounce as well. You can set it to receive pledges monthly or per thing you make. People are probably more psychologically inclined to pledge per month, but it really depends on what you're doing. Harassment dynamics that transfems face. This is the really fun part of the talk. People don't really talk about the unique harassment dynamics trans feminine people deal with. If someone calls a woman a bitch, there is a general understanding that that is misogyny. But they call trans feminine people things that are harder to respond to. Rapist, sexual predator, abuser, pedophile, etc. They often call us the thing they did to us. They call us things so bad that even denying them is destructive. Who wants to stand up in public and say they aren't those things? Who has the privilege to not get called those things in the first place? And of course, as a white person, I benefit by narratives that black people don't have access to. These flattened narratives, designed to get wider acceptance, aren't helping feminism. They're putting people in danger. Some other things I've dealt with. I've been sexually harassed. I've been misgendered. I've been intimidated away from conferences. I've been forced out of jobs. I've had other game designers harass me out of housing. I've been pressured when I worked as a curator not to cover the games of trans women who are seen as comp competition to other game designers. Working in game design gave me PTSD, a condition where I relive what happened to me every day. It's been years since certain incidents, and I still wake up and it's the first thing I think about. A feminist culture that was unwilling to intervene at any point during those years does not make me feel included. You shouldn't need to be some kind of cockroach just to make a game. Like in feminism, there's this pressure to be strong and brave and absorb a lot of pain. I don't want to be strong, I want to be happy. One thing I would suggest is moving away from community and scene and movement models with their false promise of solidarity toward what you can directly affect. The nature of idealizing a movement is that it becomes more important than people. This is why most of the harassment I described came from feminist and queer spaces. This is why a lot of spaces are rife with assault and abuse. In the zine, The Broken Teapot, an anonymous author wrote the following. There are no activist communities, only the desire for communities, or the convenient fiction of communities. A community is a material web that binds people together, for better and for worse, in interdependence. If its members move away every uh, couple years because the next place seems cooler, it is not a community. But if it is easier to kick someone out than to go through a difficult series of conversations with them, it is not a community. Among the societies that had real communities, exile was the most extreme sanction possible, tantamount to killing them. On many levels, losing the community and all the relationships it involved was the same as dying. Let's not kid ourselves, we don't have communities. For a lot of trans femmes, with their fragile health and socioeconomic status, exile is death. Here's what no one wants to say. We don't have diversity because trans femmes are regularly scapegoated and they always have been. Because we have fewer connections, many of us without family, friends, work, etc., it is easier to make us disappear. This violence is accomplished with character assassination, misgendering, gaslighting, mobbing, and ostracization. It's easier to victim blame than to take criticism. If you want to find the scene with the biggest problems, look for the one that says it has no problems. We need disarmament, not diversity. Diversity is pointless as long as the ability is retained to make marginalized people disappear into thin air. An ability founded on capitalist colonialist constructs like masculinity, the Western gender binary, and whiteness. It's like waving a gun around telling people, it's okay, I'm not going to shoot you. Naturally, my next topic is making things of PTSD, trauma, you know. I feel like trauma, for me, has been more conducive to short form than long form. I hate thinking about my future. I've been trained my whole life to hate thinking about it. It's hard to put things into the world if you feel you won't be around for it. 
I made a lot of stuff in hyper-concentrated bursts, like this talk, because doing anything that didn't numb me was terrible. A lot of the coverage and marketing apparatus is based around larger work, which, like novels, are difficult to produce without the proper material conditions. But this isn't purely about physical resources. It's important to understand the emotional barriers to creating, what they took away from us inside. All of the technical, by-the-numbers aspects of diversity don't mean anything if you don't repair a lifetime of being told our ideas don't matter. So we need emotional support. Diversity is not a substitute for friendship and warmth. A lot of trans fans who manage to get a job find themselves in a lonely, anxious, icy environment. Making games for years without access to social spaces and peers made me feel like I was crazy. I still don't have access to many of those spaces. I still get hostility from many game designers. So if you perceive similar treatment, don't blame yourself. The world has a million reasons for trans exclusion, and you don't deserve any of it. Let's be pragmatic. Anyone who is going to treat trans femmes like human beings would already have done it. If feminism wanted trans femmes, it had hundreds of years to do so. If the alt scenes wanted trans femmes, we would already be there. All this bargaining and begging for acceptance is the model of an abusive relationship. We are in an abusive relationship with the world. I write for the people who will never be accepted into these spaces, the ones who are unable to assimilate and a survival waiting to be articulated. I guess I have five minutes, so if anyone wants to, I guess, ask questions or throw things at me, that's fine. No throwing things. No throwing things. Don't do that. Questions? Yes. Hi. Generic, but uh, where can we find out more about you? Oh, uh, oh I, have, I guess I have a website. <laughs> it's pretty shameful. Um, God, uh, I mean, like, I guess if you Google Porpentine, I'm the first result. So <laughs> I've beaten the hedgehog, or, or no, I've beaten the porcupine, whatever that animal was. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They need a stick. <laughs> um, how do you feel about more ways to get more transformative people, like me, yay, solidarity, but um, into more sustainable, like, income situations? Like, actually, we're both making approximately the same, me on GitTip, you on Patreon, but like I've got a dozen friends and they all aren't gonna get one K a month. Like, oh yeah, no, that's that's all yeah. bullshit. Like it's all bullshit and luck. Like, yeah, I was just yeah. Hey, yeah, sorry. <laughs> if, if anyone here has me going, yeah, right? Like it, I don't anyway. Your opinions. It, uh, besides that it was bullshit, unless you don't have more opinions. But, I, also, I mean like Patreon and all that shit is bullshit. Like if, to clarify, I mean I mean getting I mean, I think the things I described can be potentially helpful to people in certain situations, but yeah, like, it's a completely, you know, corrupt system and that not a lot of people have access to. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's really hard to figure out. I mean, I'm kind of figuring that out myself. Like, um, like for the last years, I've, I've lived, like, with other trans people in, like, pretty small rooms and, like, kind of hold our resources, it's kind of a very diverse set of tactics required to survive. And like, yeah, the whole art thing requires, it's just, it's so sleazy and it's not like some fit-all solution for people. It's just been one that I've been lucky to find. This, this one's a statement. I do basically the same thing. Like I take that same amount of resources that I was just getting to myself and I'm like, I want all of my transitions to have this. And I'm like, well, I can't get more. I'm just gonna share it and spread myself thinner so that I can support like three or four people on what I was already getting, right? Because there isn't like, there isn't like an endless well of like Bill Gates's to fund trans people to just give them like it, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I mean, trans people actually having physical resources is something that I feel is really ignored in favor of like tokenism and success stories. And like, there's so many people who like, okay, for me, it took uh, many, many years to just get to the point where I could feel okay, like creating when there's like all this trauma for people to work through, like people basically need like, it's like a huge wound that's just staggering to look at. People who grew up without families, people who need, yeah, it's a, it's a massive wound. And I think it's beyond me articulating it. I guess, um, in building from that, is it possible that if enough people got together that we could create an alternative payment system that deals with these issues? Or, like, in, in the spirit of, like, solving the problem that's there? Uh, so, wait, sorry, were you not finished with your thought? Yeah, pretty much. Thank you.